All right, welcome to modules 18 and 19, which are all about population dynamics. Um, our question for the day, or our thinking uh, question, is going to be these two images here, which are part of a video that we'll see later on in the presentation. The first question I have for you is, what do you think each of these white blobs or sections are? What do you think these numbers represent? And why do you think some of these blobs are growing bigger or faster or in larger spaces than others? You know, this is a population of a certain species, and we're going to be learning a little bit about how we can apply models and data to understand their growth, their success, and what it means for humans. So the key concepts, um, we're doing two modules. We're going to be thinking about um, different parameters of population ecology and density dependent and independent factors that influence things like carrying capacity and population growth. We're going to look at different types of growth models and population growth and how we can apply those different models to different species lifestyles and understand how they grow and respond to different factors. Um, the questions I have for you is what is the connection between growth models, reproductive strategies, and survivorship curves? Do humans have a curing capacity? We'll talk more about what that is in a few minutes. And are D density dependent or independent factors more or less important for population growth? And there should be a question mark right there. All right, so some terms for populations. A population is just a collection of individuals that we define for one species in a given area at a given time. So we can talk about the state of Vermont in terms of a population of humans or moose. If you look at this infographic right over here, moose in the past couple decades have really shrunk in terms of their population for a whole host of reasons, part of which includes infestation of winter ticks, ticks that are resistant to winter conditions. And Vermont's winters, unfortunately, are getting warmer and more wet, which means that these guys are actually doing better. So within the realm of population ecology, we study how different populations interact with other species and their ecosystems over time, i.e. moose and ticks in Vermont. We can look at numbers of moose, the growth of moose, the distribution of moose, and more to understand how a population is changing over time. Now the future health and growth of a population depends on these five current parameters within a population. The first is size. We can talk about the total number of moose, the number of offspring in a moose population, the number of moose that are reproducing. This gives us a framework to think about future growth. Now we can also talk about density. We can look at the number of moose per acre or square kilometer. The moose density in Vermont is quite low. And this might be important for overlap of different moose individuals and mate choice, which can influence the overall size. So it's not just the number, it's how spread out or how concentrated are individuals. The distribution of a population is also really important. Where are we finding those individuals? Are they in clumps? Are they spaced out? Is it random? This can really affect the grouping, but the mating and behavioral choices. Moose in the Northeast tend to be quite monogamous. One male and one female moose tend to reproduce and have offspring. While in greater concentrations of moose in British Columbia and Alaska, uh, moose tend to exhibit a uh, characteristic called lex, where there are a variety of female moose individuals that are generally all within a collection that might have one male moose that reproduces with all of them. It really has to do with the distribution of both male and females, which gets us to our sex ratio. Imbalances between one or the other gender, um, or sex, I'm sorry, can have big ramifications for reproductive success, which will influence the health and mating strategies of populations. Don't assume that a 50-50 male to female bounce is actually a good thing. Oh, in a lot of populations, there tends to be more females than males in a given population due to just innate mating strategies. And then finally, age. We can talk about regeneration and succession of generations, the overall survival of a species in terms of their lifespan, how many reach five, 10, or 15 years. This is all important for just understanding how a population changes over time. Now, there's two big types of factors that influence 
the growth and success of populations. Density dependent and density independent. Now within density dependent factors, we're really looking at living resources. Things that when they change, really control the size of the population and their ability to grow in the future. This could be habitat availability or food or mate choice. So in Vermont, as we've continued to urbanize the amount of land sort of in the Chittenden, Addison, Bennington area, moose populations have less and less available corridors and habitat, which has been an influential factor in terms of the number of moose in Vermont. They're really now in the neck. Um, independent factors, however, such as climate and weather, can indirectly influence dependent variables, maybe like food choice, but they also directly influence populations regardless of size. They hit every individual, no matter if there's a 10, 100, or a 1,000 moose. So, for example, Vermont's number of days below 32 degrees Fahrenheit um, have significantly decreased over time, which is, again, really influence the number of ticks that we find on moose. Hi, Quinn. I'm recording work for next week, but you can head to lunch. Um, sorry about that. This is a shout out to Quinn in a week. Um, so that's the two broad types of factors that influence growth. Now, when we get to growth, we can really apply mathematical models to understand how populations are growing over time. Ideally, we don't want to be talking a population decline. The first model that you'll see in module 19 is exponential growth, where a small change in x, could be years, could be individuals, has a very large change in y. Um, we often discuss populations in this model, but the idea is that as x changes linearly, we see a huge rapid change in the y variable. Now, when we apply this to exponential growth in populations, one of the main factors is the intrinsic growth rate. Um, or how does a change of y population change with one unit of x? And this assumes that populations and individuals have limitless resources, which we know isn't the case, but it's an assumption. For an example of an intrinsic growth rate for something that's near and dear to all of our hearts, the R rate of COVID without any protective measures like social distancing, hand washing, masks, is 5.7, which means for every individual that's infected, another 5.7 individuals can be infected. So you think about the math, 5.7 leads to 25, which leads to 125, which leads to 625. That R value is really important in determining the growth rate, the curve of a population. Now, the change in Y depends on a couple things. The initial population, what is the initial population before growth, the time or change interval, the longer the time, the greater the growth, and also the growth rate. The growth rate will influence the steepness of the curve. Now these graphs are showing something that will explain the video and our thinking question of the day. Antibiotics and antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, antibiotics are really important for agriculture and human health. We apply them to fight nasty infections and the projected growth if Tr uh, trends continue for antibiotics in the future is pretty exponential. More people, more cows, more needs. I, uh, additionally, though, the number of bacteria that we find that are resistant to modern-day antibiotics have also been exponentially increasing. So there's probably going to be an arms race between bacteria and humans in terms of exponential growth in both of these variables. So this is a video that was done in Harvard. It's a super cool video looking at populations of that bacteria that are being selected within communities based on antibiotic um, densities. The bacteria that survive um, an initial dosage of antibiotics will evolve to a new strain, a new species that will experience exponential growth. They'll then experience a new, more concentrated environment of antibiotics, which will lead to the process starting over again. Now what we're finding from this video is that bacteria are having uh, more and more resistance to antibiotics. We're seeing an exponential growth in the number of bacteria and the number of strains of bacteria that can fight our antibiotics, which is very worrisome for future human health. So let's take a look at this video. Mm -hmm. 
So what we ended up building was basically a petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic, up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads, until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. So it's really worrisome for future human health and medical professions and how you might be treated with a simple cut in the future. Now, to understand... So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish. Now, to understand limits to growth, we need to first examine logistical growth. Now, the logistical growth model assumes that growth cannot be exponential or limitless forever. There's always going to be some factors that limit growth, and we tend to call these the carrying capacity factors. Now, carrying capacity says that for um, any population, there's a certain number of individuals that can be supported within that environment. These are generally density-dependent factors that sort of create the carrying capacity and limit the growth as populations approach it. It could be food. It could be reproduction rates. It could be the health of individuals. Um, all of these factors are influencing the ability for populations to not really have exponential growth forever. Um, and each species and each population has a very unique carrying capacity the carrying capacity of Vermont's moose are going to be different than Alaska's moose based on size, resources, climate, and so much more. Now, when it comes to humans, the question is, do we have a carrying capacity? Now, we've talked before about ecological footprints. If every person in the United States, or not the United States, the world, lived the same lifestyle as the United States, we would need 4.8 Earth's worth of resources. And when we look at the growth of human populations over time, really wasn't exponential in terms, in ter in, in ter yeah, I'm tongue-tied. It was, it was not exponential growth until we first utilized fossil fuels and other modern-day conveniences that suddenly allowed us to support a much larger population given limits on resources. So something that we're going to be exploring for the rest of this um, class is really like, what is the ideal number of humans? and How do we balance that with our lifestyle and resource preferences? Now, in terms of bacteria and antibiotic resistant bacteria, we have two different types of reproductive rates, R and K species. We talked earlier about moose, and we saw the ticks that were causing moose populations to decline, and we saw bacteria. Both of those show R species reproductive strategies. They tend to grow very rapidly, and they tend to experience die-offs if there are limiting resources. They generally overshoot their carrying capacity. So ticks are able to have lots of offspring, and they might overshoot their carrying capacity, but given the low density of moose, that large overshoot can overtly affect the density and health of moose. Now, moose are a case-selected species. They tend to grow slow, 
they tend to be limited by carrying capacity before they even reach overshoot or they overshoot their carrying capacity. And they're really affected on a day-to-day -day basis by density dependent factors. So this prey, predator, or host um, pathogen dynamic often shows up in feedback loops where one overshoots leading to the growth of the other. The die-off of the first due to limiting resources causes the other to plummet. So there's a playback between prey, predator and prey. The general notion is that our species tend to grow fast, K species tend to grow slowly, which has important ramifications for things like conservation um, and extinction rates of species. Now when we plot, think about reproductive strategies and we look at things like sexual maturity, density, lifespan, and more in terms of population characteristics, we can really create three broad types of survivorship curves. The first is type 1 species. They generally have a really high survivorship age or survivorship rate until old age when most of the individuals die. These tend to be case selected species in large mammals like elephants, humans, whales, bears. The second is type 2 where we have basically consistent rates of survivorship from birth to death. There's really no fluctuation. These tend to be things like squirrels or birds or things that generally live for, um, they don't have large die-offs at the death or the birth period. And then finally, we have type 3. Type 3 has a huge amount of um, death at birth. This generally is due to really large offspring clutches and low parental care. And then death really dwind or uh, survivorship rates really stay consistent until we approach the zero. These tend to be our selected species, fish, insects, anything that really has a lot of individuals at birth and they can't provide a lot of care. Well, type 1 species tend to have one to two babies per clutch or per reproductive event. This does not standardize age. It doesn't look at which species live the longest in terms of years. It's really just when does a population experience death. And species can have different survivorship uh, curves based on low, medium, or high density and dependent factors. So the survivorship curves can change based on different factors coming from the environment. So that was module 18 and 19 in a nutshell. You should feel good about different types of survivorship curves, RNK species, the logistical and exponential growth models, density and density factors, and population terms.